Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission <laughs> on March 14th, 2019. This is a special meeting uh, with one agenda item, and we'll call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call, please. Commissioner Schiffer? Here. Conway? Here. Spellman? Here. Nielsen? Singleton? Here. Greenberg? Here. Chair Pepe? Present. Um, and I don't, uh, I'll ask for any statements of disqualification. Seeing none, we'll move on to the public hearing. Normally at general meetings, we ask for oral communications for items not on the agenda item, but not on the agenda, but since it's a special meeting with only one agenda item, we will go to the public hearing and item number one, the um, telecommunications ordinance. So staff has a presentation. Yeah, Mike Ferry with planning. <clears throat> Um, good evening, commissioners. So in 1996, the uh, federal government approved the Telecommunication Reform Act. Uh, it established uh, regulations on how uh, carriers could site their um, facilities. It uh, significantly included a section of the act, section 704, that says no state or local government may regulate the placement, construction, or modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the FCC regulations. So what that means is we can't regulate on RF emissions more stringent than the federal government allows. And what we have done since the, um, since 2000 anyway, since I've been here, is required each of these new applications to submit a radio frequency analysis. <clears throat> the analysis is that we get with an application is modeled based on the um, topography, building heights, stuff like that, the power of the radio, uh, uh, receivers, uh, the antenna height, all these variables go into it. We require a registered professional engineer in the state of California to do those calculations. If a project is approved, we give it a tentative approval. It can operate for up to 45 days, and then we ask for an on-site analysis where they actually go out with uh, equipment and measure the RF frequencies that the uh, situation or that the uh, installation is uh, producing. So in, in almost all of the uh, facilities that I've handled, quite a few, um, there was one where they were going to have, I think, four towers in a cluster together, and all of those would generate about 10% of what the federal government allowed at ground level. Uh, most of the ones that we've seen that Primarily, we're gonna be talking about tonight are these distributed antenna systems that go out in the public right-of-way, and I haven't seen any that even reach the level of 1% of what the federal government allows. So we're allowed to ask them to show us that it meets the FCC guidelines, uh, but we can't regulate the placement based on any uh, health effects that people might be concerned with. Um, we are allowed to uh, regulate the visual, the aesthetics, and that's primarily what we're looking at uh, tonight. So currently, the entitlement process for the cellular uh, systems that are going out into the right-of-way take about 180 to 270 days to process, and that's because we have to go through the planning entitlement process, which is usually three to six months to get to a... a decision at a public hearing. After that <laughs> approval, they go into the uh, Public Works Department for an encroachment and uh, road opening and all of those types of permits. That's usually about 90 days. So part of the new ruling that we're gonna be discussing tonight limits our uh, abilities to process these applications. And the limitation is 60 days for a facility if they wanna use an existing pole and put their antenna on top of it and all their equipment. We've got 60 days from when the application is submitted to when it has to have a decision. If it's a situation where they're going to replace a pole or add a new pole into the pole system, then we have 90 days. So our current entitlement process uh, with public works and planning varies from 180 to 270 days, 
and the new rule requires us to respond within 60 or 90 days. Um, failure to comply with the shot clock will result in the facility being deemed approved. So to um, try to conform with these new shot clock requirements, we're basically asking that the entitlement process in the the zoning ordinance be eliminated for these DAS systems out in the right of way. Uh, Public Works is currently writing a new chapter. Um, it's going to be in the streets and sidewalks section. It's 1538, and they're going to have a whole bunch of regulations. They're going to have the same kind of submittal requirements that we currently have in the zoning ordinance, which is about three pages long, and. Uh, Last that, um, well, I don't, uh, I don't want to talk about, um, w we're working with the city attorney's office, um, with carriers and with the public trying to generate an ordinance that uh, sort of satisfies everybody, but still will get through this shot clock process. So I've got some slides. So on September of 2018, September 26, the FCC adopted this declaratory <coughs> ruling and third report and order in the manner of accelerating wireless deployment by removing barriers to infrastructure. So that was totally set up to get these things through as quickly as possible. Um, the FCC ruling was published in October and it became effective 90 days after that, which was on January 13th. So the new ruling adopts standards and limitations when a local can prohibit or deny small cell facilities. The new deadlines, the shot clocks that I described, the 60 and 90 day shot clocks are in effect now. Uh, they also put a limitation on the fees and the rents that an agency can um, charge for using their equipment, you know, their street lights, stuff like that. Um, they uh, generated new aesthetics um, requirements and new standards for spacing and undergrounding requirements. So we think that we've incorporated all of those into this proposed um, uh, public works ordinance. The public works ordinance doesn't go through the planning commission. You don't have a purview over that. It doesn't go to the public works commission. It goes straight to the city council for approval. So we are going to bring the result of tonight's ordinance request with that public works new ordinance to the city council on. Oh shoot, I put a note in here somewhere, April 9th. So the city council will hear both of those ordinances on April 9th. We'll probably be co-presenting it, both um, myself and someone from Public Works, so that it hopefully makes sense to the city council. Um, so I've already explained the shot clock rules, the 60 and 90 day. Um, in terms of aesthetics, the FCC says that uh, the requirements have to be reasonable. So it kind of has to be in line with, with other uh, utilities that are going in the right of way, which is kind of tricky because we don't have any regulations over uh, PG&E. They can put a pole and their transformers and all that stuff uh, where they want. But these guys, at least we can apply some reasonable um, aesthetic requirements. Uh, it must be um, non-discriminatory, and that's that's going to be an interesting one if, if they compare themselves to uh, current um, folks that use the uh, public right-of-way, like PG&E, for instance. And uh, primarily, and what's important is that it has to, those guidelines have to be published in advance of that date, April 15th, 2019, and it's not clear if we miss that date that we can come back later and publish something in terms of design guidelines. So we are on a, a pretty good crunch. I did include the design guidelines for you guys. Many of you commissioners have seen these before. These are examples of uh, facilities that have been installed that don't have guidelines. And they have all kinds of um, uh, crazy approaches to this. They've got arms that come out of the telephone pole and they put the antenna on top and then they've got their radio remote units in a box. They've got uh, PG&E electric meters down here, uh, switching equipment in this box. 
they're, they're all rusty and there's graffiti on them. Here's another example of uh, the same kind of thing. Decals. Uh, this one has outrigger arms that hold the antennas that are facing the directions that they want the antennas to go and then all the associated equipment uh, just bolted to the uh, pole. And that's, that's what we're trying to avoid, avoid by um, having these design standards. And the design standards are basically going to look for designs like this, where all the cabling is uh, and the antennas are within a shroud. Um, if it's a, a city street light, all the wiring will go down inside of the light pole. Uh, we're not going to allow traffic signals to have these, but this was a good example of what a street light might look like in the future. All the wiring and all that stuff, the antenna in the shroud, and then the uh, wiring going down. These are some other examples. And, and we sort of developed this by coming to you folks, um, I don't know how many times we came up here, 15, 16, 20 times something, and we kind of slowly whittled down what you would go for and what you wouldn't go for. We started indicating this to our applicants and they started to respond, and I think a lot of other agencies have um, also come up with the design guidelines that are pretty similar to this. So in the zoning ordinance right now, we uh, regulate all cell installations on public and in the, the right of way. And what we're proposing is that all of these smaller systems in the right of way are eliminated. You can flip through the um, existing telecom ordinance and see the strikeout and underlying language. We define what a small cell is. That definition comes directly from the FCC. And I think the intention behind this whole thing is they're going to roll out a lot of these throughout the uh, city. We've heard numbers like 100 of them. About a year ago, we were at a conference over the hill and there was an AT&T representative that said that this new distributed antenna system is what they were going to be looking for in the future. It allowed them to locate in residential districts where the, the more, um, uh, robust cell towers that we've seen for the last 15 years. Those, those have all gone on private property. You know, you've seen the fake trees and the monopoles and all these various things. Um, they came up with an engineering solution that um, to them is, is more appealable in residential neighborhoods. So that's really what this is. We're trying to meet the new shot clock deadlines um, so that projects aren't deemed approved and we're trying to come in under the wire with a design ordinance that gives us some sort of aesthetic control over uh, the situation that we're finding ourselves in. Um, we do have um, representatives from the city attorney's office. Um, I thought we were going to have a representative. We do have a representative from the public works department. So if we have questions on what that ordinance has looked like, but it's evolving right now. So we do have those two folks, if you have any uh, either legal or public works types of questions. And then I'm available, this that, uh, is the rest of the presentation. We're hoping that you guys approve the uh, recommended ordinance revisions and that you've looked through the design um, standards that we've got and you either make suggestions or recommend that the city council approve that as well so I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you. So commissioners, um, any questions for staff before we go to um, public comment and then we'll come back to the commission to see what we wanna do with it. Um, Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, one question on a clarification on the new public works ordinance and how that meshes with the, the wireless ordinance that we're proposing. I know that there's that's just controlling certain elements that are in the right of way that have to be dealt with. Yeah. It was unclear how that. So, so right now we've got this entitlement process and planning that <laughs> takes the gargantuan amount of the time that, it, that uh, the whole process takes. And then after that, they go to public works. So we're, it's an either or. So the smartest thing, what we think is the smartest thing is to eliminate it from planning and just go to public works. So they'll apply for, they'll generate a name for this. It'll be a public works permit. And they'll run that through within that 
a time frame that they have to run it through. So I think what, what we're envisioning is that somebody will go to the public works counter, they'll say, what do we have to do to apply to one of these things? They'll get handed um, a submittal, a list of submittal requirements, and then it'll have all the stuff that we currently have in the zoning ordinance in terms of submittal, which is exhaustive. It'll have a RF report, photo simulations, they'll require all of that stuff. They'll send one of those sets of plans to planning, and then I'll get that set of plans and I'll look at it and compare it to the design guidelines, and then I'll give a recommendation or comments to Public Works. Ultimately, it'll be the uh, Public Works Director's call. There's gonna be some situations like we ran into um, in front of the Safeway on Morrissey, where when, when the um, actual permit plans came, there was all kinds of trenching that was gonna be required throughout that intersection. And Public Works had just paved that road, so they, they really didn't like that, so they sort of battled back and forth. In a situation like that, the Public Works director might think that it's uh, a better idea, a better solution to put some of the stuff on the pole, some of the equipment. So the way we're thinking now is ultimately it's gonna be the Public Works director's call um, I don't know that that will happen all of the time, uh, or not all of the time. I don't think that will happen uh, very often, but we do want that in there. Did that answer your question, right. Peter? One other question is, so I don't know if it was two years ago, we had, I wanna say almost 200 of these potentially coming before us that all, all of a sudden went on hold. Right. I think there was some ruling that was gonna come out supposedly in their favor. And so they were all just gonna wait and go for the easier process. Is this, is this where we are now? This is the, the easier process theoretically for, for the approval? I can't really say why they went on hold. My theory is that's what happened. There was also a state bill circulating that was going to be just as extreme as this new bill that was approved by the feds. So I think they were holding for one or the other of those um, legislative things. I, I haven't been hearing from any of them, so so I, I can't really answer that. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin, did you have a question? A couple of questions. Sure. The encroachment permit from that would be given by the Public Works Director is appealable to the City Council or not? I believe at this time that we are adding an appeal section to that. Hello, commissioners. My name is Joshua Spangard, senior civil engineer, uh, Public Works. Yes, it will be appealable to the public, uh, to city council. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. My second question has to do with the language in the ordinance. Um, as you'll remember, I had a concern that there was no uh, formal tie-in between the ordinance and the design guidelines. And you sent me back some um, language for section 24, 12, 15, 10, I think it was. 14, 10, number seven? Yes, and where um, you suggested adding the language at the end of seven, so it would read small cell facilities located in a public right of way, which is subjected, subject to the requirements of chapter 1538 of the municipal code. Um, and then you added the language, which I, uh, was wondering about and s small cell standards and guidelines policy adopted by the city council. So is that, uh, you didn't mention that in your staff report, is that part of the staff recommendation to have that language added? Yeah, what I had sent you was, I, I said that's a good suggestion. We already had this written in the staff report, it was already written, so I couldn't change anything at that point. But if you read that into the record, we can certainly include that there. I, I, okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions from commissioners or staff? We'll invite the public to um, share um, your comment on this and invite everyone to line up on the right side of the room. We invite you to um, state your name if you would. Um, please sign in and um, everyone will have two minutes to address the commission. And after we don't have a dialogue back and forth, we'll just receive your comments and then we'll close the public hearing and deliberate as a commission on how to uh, decide whether we're gonna move forward with this. Thank you for being here and welcome. Come on up. 
I am Mariposa, and I'm here to speak for the butterflies and also for the bees. Here they are. We can't forget our friends. They have no voice, and neither do we. We don't even have a choice anymore. When a person picks up a cell phone, it has a warning in it. Doesn't put it on the outside like cigarettes or alcohol, that it's deleterious to all living things and kills babies and causes cancer. All these are proven facts. Scientific fact, facts, not suggestions or uh, supposes. So if we are not allowed to opt out like we did it when uh, PG&E mandated that we had to have a smart meter, then we don't have any rights as citizens anymore. We're just corporate beans to be counted and expelled and to suffer. I suffer constantly, that's why I know about the bees and the butterflies. They are suffering too. Not to mention the birds, the bees, the butterflies, the trees. Every living thing vibrates with, and we have to have sleep. And it says here that um, the, the, uh, we, need, we also have rights of equality here, and supposedly as citizens, and yet the firefighters are allowed to opt out, and the first responders are allowed to opt out, but everyone else's hands are tied by the laws of the land. These laws are draconian, and they're not acceptable, first of all. That's it. Thank you for your comment. Hello, thank you for your service. I know you all are having to uh, listen to a lot of things and make important decisions, and I appreciate that. Uh, is there any chance that I could have a little more than two minutes? Because I have two or three uh, things that I'd like to talk about. How about th three minutes? Okay, thank okay. you. Can you thank change you. that test? My name's Rico yeah. Baker, <clears throat> and uh, I came here to go to the university. I was in the first class at Stevenson in 1965, 66, and uh, I'm a, a Navy veteran, um, and I happen to be very sensitive to uh, electromagnetic um, frequencies. Uh, part of it come from the Navy and being a year in Vietnam, not only getting sprayed with uh, Agent Orange and other things, but my job on the ship was also something where I was around radar and a lot of other electronic equipment as a quartermaster. Anyway, I, I have um, sensitivity to electromagnetic frequencies, and I'd like to give you a little bit of a background because Part of what's going on here is that we don't really understand electricity. We never really have. It's, it's magic, right? We just think, wow, we plug things in, and, and especially Wi-Fi. We do something here, and over there, something happens. But what happens is there's a signal sent. There's a signal sent between the antenna and, and the receiver, and whatever's in between, if you imagine that there's enough power now and they keep upping it all the time, none of these rules that we're supposed to stay beneath have anything to do what the real um, meaning is on the human body. And, and they were made many years ago. So we're talking about something, first of all, that, that is dangerous, and it's dangerous at a level much lower than what's set. So that's, that's just one thing. The other thing I wanna talk about is something that you all are actually where the rubber meets the road. You get to make some decisions for, for we the people. And what I want you to know is because of the Constitution, and I, I don't know if you guys take a, a oath or not, I know the, the city commissioners do, or the city uh, council, but what it says is that it's not only the right but it's the duty of the state if the federal government gets out of line. 
right now the FCC is made up of people that are, there's going to be trillions of dollars made on this deal with the 5G that they're now trying to roll out. The towers that you're listening about now are just a step in that direction. They wanna put hundreds of these, thousands of these up, and they wanna put 20,000 satellites. So it's an important decision, and I hope you'll really think about it on a, on a very deep level. You have not only the right, but the duty, if the federal government is doing something that hurts the people, it's your duty to say the feds. Thank you for your comments. I'm Glenn Chase, I'm a professor locally. Can I have three minutes, please? I've been called by about four people to please come here tonight and talk to you. That's why I sh shouldn't have done that, but sure. Go ahead, okay. three, three minutes. Yeah. I've worked with uh, the city and the county on the light brown apple moth and was key to stopping it. I've also worked with the court on the uh, getting the opt out for the smart meters. Real quickly, I have a handout that I'll give you when I leave, but if you, they call uh, wireless radiation electromagnetic, the insurance companies. So I Googled electromagnetic radiation and insurance and it says, Insurer Lloyds of London has excluded any coverage for injury resulting directly or indirectly from electromagnetic radiation. The second sheet says World Health Organization possibly carcinogenic, carcinogenic to humans. The third sheet is a disclosure by Verizon, and there is one of these for each wireless company. Notice it's to the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, not to the public. It says, wireless our wireless business also faces personal injury and consumer class action lawsuits relating to alleged health effects of uh, radio frequency transmitters. We may be required to pay significant awards or settlements. They are not required to uh, divulge to disclose frivolous lawsuits. The next sheet is a fact sheet on cell tower health studies that are done around the world and they're more free to speak about this because they don't have the parent company located within their national boundaries like we do. And then another one, and this one has animals, because a lot of people that care about things tend to care about animals. And of course, it talks about the problems with animals. Here's the safety distance from these transmitters. It varies from 500 to 1,000 feet to be safe. And the final sheet is a nationwide insurance company policy that's been cut and pasted so you can see the relevant items, so I didn't bring something that was two inches thick. It shows that nationwide insurance also will not uh, cover electromagnetic in any way, but the grouping is they exclude asbestos, electromagnetic, lead, and radon. I would encourage you, whatever methods you have, do not fast track this for the simplicity of administration. In some number of years from now, I wish it was 10 years ago, they won't be allowed to do this. Um, it's just like asbestos, it's like lead, it's like methyl bromide. It's more difficult because we can't see this. I'm an expert in environmental toxins. People smell pesticides, they trust you. But if they can't see it and they've got an addiction to a phone, which you only need to be about so far away for relative safety, but not the towers. The towers are the significant bombs of this, of this um, toxin, and I hope you can do the, I, I hope you can not fast track this. Thank you so much. Uh, Steve Goncannon, lifetime resident, born and raised in Santa Cruz, benefited from being here, going to school, et cetera. Uh, uh, Mr. Chase brought up in another meeting that the, these rulings that were so well talked about are subject to interpretation. The FCC and the, these, these rulings I feel are biased. This, this, what do we call it, partnering now with uh, these big companies, Verizon and such, with the federal government and big business could be disastrous. Now, one attorney looked into this and said we would be better off to make a stand now 
And the rumor is Verizon will go against the city. And I would say, let them. We have attorneys. We have a voice. Because the repercussions, as Mr. Chase has said, they're going to be phenomenal, far exceed the cigarette industry. I don't know if they'll exceed the, uh, the drug problems we're having with addiction. But this fast track needs to be slowed down. Our, our, our decision making, our jurisdiction needs to be here. California now is standing up to states' rights versus federalism. It's our, it's our job, and most of us think of ourselves as well-balanced states' rights people. And we have things <coughs> pending in our, uh, at Sacramento now, and we need time to review this. So fast track, or as they call this, shotgunning or whatever, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's gonna get us in the foot. So I wanna leave something for those that come behind us. And uh, um, this, this, this is crisis. This is about as serious as anything I've come up with in my lifetime. I'd like you to consider these things, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. I'm, I'm here representing EMF Aware. I would, I would like to have three minutes, too, if possible. I would have requested that ahead of time if I thought I could. Okay, thank you. I've written you a couple of letters already. Um, I, I think you've done some good things in the ordinance. I appreciate them. Uh, there's some changes I'd like to ask for as well. Um, other cities have incorporated 1,500 feet distance between their installations. And, and what, we've, what we back that up with is that um, Verizon's own CEO, Lowell McAdam, I've sent you a video of it, has quoted that these frequencies can travel 2,000 feet or more. There is no line of sight problem with that. So there's no reason whatsoever that they need to be as close as they're saying they do. And that would help a lot. It would no, but it takes away from people's, um, the value of their homes. I mean, it's really too bad to have to just only talk about these things. I'm also EMF sensitive as well, so to me, I could no longer live in Santa Cruz if this happens. But I know you're prohibited from talking about that, which makes me want to cry every time I hear those words spoken, because it seems completely absurd that a government could say you cannot talk about health or the environment and rule on those grounds. But I would also like to add that um, I was really concerned about moving everything to the Public Works Department because it seemed to me that the public process would be completely eliminated, which feels very troubling. So I'm happy to hear we could at least appeal to the City Council, but I wonder about that. So is that gonna cost us something to do that? Because we don't have money, we shouldn't have to pay. I mean, some appeals cost $1,200 in the county level. So we, we should not be expected to do something like that. We do have a right, these are our rights. We can't be denied our rights to public comment. So um, also I wanna say what some other towns have done is when with the shot clock, since, and actually there's a very good chance that these rulings are gonna be overturned. There's a lot of legal challenges right now to the FCC's rulings. And if they are overturned and we get this new process in that doesn't allow any public comment, we're stuck with it. So it's gonna be very hard to reverse that. So I say we should not be hasty and implement something like that. We, the city, the city council has made two resolutions opposing the FCC's actions. And so it's time for us to put some power behind that in our actions. So what some other towns have done is they have immediately denied without prejudice all incomplete applications immediately when they come in to keep the shot clocks from tolling. So is that the end? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Hello, I'm Joanne Welfeld from Scotts Valley. 4G is said to take our health and our well-being on the alternative media sites. 5G in millimeter wave frequencies 
in all hours alters our mind and our brain. And if left in millimeter frequencies too long, you will have permanent brain damage. It's just incredible that we're living in a time right now where we as a humanity is being taken hostage by telecom, by an industry that's controlling our lives and our health and probably our, our closer passing away. And to be responsible for families and see this happening to your kids, your teenagers or your young adults, it, it, it's like we're not really living in a reality. It is absolutely proven that radiation is dangerous at any level. It alters human and animal cells. Cancer, diabetes, and autoimmune are conditions that come from radiation commonly. Cancer isn't something that comes outside of the body and comes in. Cancer are normal cells that alter from environmental factors, such as ingesting toxic foods, particularly over a long period of time, toxic environment, as we know, asbestos and various other things, and radiation. Radiation that alters cells in the human body and in animal bodies. The scientists who say, who have been studying non-ionizing radiation for years, say that all human life and life on this planet will probably not exist if we actually go to 5G. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. My name is Suzanne Davis. I've lived in the county for 37 years. Um, um, the current wave of unconstitutional regulations regarding small cell installations issued by the Federal Communications Commission should be a grave concern to you all. We have a right to health and safety in our own neighborhoods. Corporations that have no regard for anything but profit need to be stopped. That brings us to the illicit, immoral, and unconstitutional laws being forced upon us and our municipalities by the FCC. A recent Harvard ethics study entitled Captured Agency, how the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industry it presumably regulates, succinctly describes the revolving door between the agency's executive leadership and the telecom industry. The negative impacts of the collusion of the telecom industry and government on our communities is only beginning to be understood because of the suppression of information on wireless technology not sponsored by the industry. The health effects from non-thermal wireless radiation are dire, yet the FCC has systematically denied overwhelming proof of this. A vast array of worldwide scientific peer-reviewed studies shows that this radiation unequivocally harms all life forms. 5G deployment with small cell facil facilities every few hundred feet in every neighborhood, issuing pulsed microwaves which penetrate deeper into the body than previous generations of wireless radiation will threaten every living organism. Do not allow this federal agency to take away our human rights to health, safety, and self-determination. Now is the time to make a stand for your own rights and the rights of the people of this community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Bruce, <clears throat> Bruce Tanner. Thank you for c bringing in the consideration of compliance with the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act that protects people who have electromagnetic sensitivity who are a protected class of people in the United States now. And we're going to be seeing many, many more we're gonna be seeing millions and millions of people who are gonna be electrosensitive because the levels that we're being exposed to are ramping up all over. These are serious harms, in certain cases, permanent harms to our biology. <coughs> I agree that the distance between these facilities has to be at a minimum 1,500 feet. Lowell McAdams actually said that they have demonstrated at Verizon that the 5G waves 
will travel 3,000 feet and they don't have to be line of sight. So when they say they want to have things incredibly close together, beware. The levels of exposure that we're experiencing now are, you know, there's nothing like them in human history or in geological history for the planet. This is being done by forces that have tremendous power and ungodly budgets. In a certain sense, they're waging war on the people of this country. And, and I, don't, I don't know what to tell you what to do. Obviously, staff will tell you that you're constrained in what you can do over and over and over again. They'll tell you <coughs> that you're under the supremacy clause of the Constitution. <coughs> but somehow, we have to protect people. Otherwise, it is going to be an electromagnetic holocaust. Thank you very much. For your comments. My name's Alyssa Barnes. I've lived in Santa Cruz for 30 years. I want to thank everybody for their service to the community. I'm here really just to support the slowing down of adopting more radio frequency devices in our community. Many before me have spoken eloquently on the reasons why to do that. I honestly believe from my research that more layers of radiation are going to affect more people and that we are going to be in a very problematic situation. We are already in a problematic situation and I honestly believe that this will cause more problems than it will solve. So I'm just here to give you a heartfelt request to slow things down do not speed these through just for the uh, benefit of the big business at hand. I believe that the FCC will be brought down. I know the problem here is that many people do not understand the dangers. I see people all the time with their cell phones and other devices, and we're not as a community saying don't use those, just do what we can to slow things down. So anything that you can do is deeply appreciated. Um, the 1,500 foot distance is helpful, and this is certainly not a question of aesthetics. <laughs> so uh, that's just really silly. Um, small communities like ours need to take the strong stand. And I'm proud to live in Santa Cruz and in California and to have that opportunity. So I just really uh, support you, and I will stand by you for any uh, strong stand that you can make to slow down the telecommunications industry and to keep our community one that is somewhat free, more so free from the uh, exposure to radiation. So thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Hi, my name's Darius Bosonino. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody, the majority of folks who came here tonight and spoke are well-meaning and passionate folks and so forth, but at the end of the day, we need to rely on real science. Um, there's not been one, there's no way to, to even identify or de diagnose an EMS sensitivity. There's been no known recorded case of any ailment, diabetes, cancer, et cetera, due to EMF radiation. And in fact, the peak, by the way, I'm an, for full disclosure, I'm an electrical engineer with degrees from and uh, bachelor's and a master's in EE, and this is kind of my field. Um, <clears throat> the peak, the peak, peak frequency for uh, where the body absorbs radiation is in the 200 to 700 megahertz band. KPIGs at 1.7. We've been radiated by KPIG through our bodies for the last how many years? 40 years. Has there been any known issues with that? And there was some misinformation I heard about 5G and millimeter waves. They don't actually absorb, they're not absorbed by the body, they're actually reflected by the body, the human body. <clears throat> um, and the beauty of 5G is actually in the small cells because when you blank in an area with small cells, each the power is much reduced as opposed to large towers that radiate more, more um, uh, higher intensity waves, which again are well, well below the uh, standards for set by the FDA and other institutions both here and abroad. So, um, uh, and just from an economic point of view, I mean, 5G is kind of the next major advancement. 
I don't know if you're familiar with the Internet of Things, but that's where everything is connected, and possibly including your toilet for that matter. And um, it's really, without 5G in this country, we're basically going to be a third world country compared to the rest of the world. And it's the most, it, it, it is the, this infrastructure. Please be key. quiet while, while every, <coughs> thank were, you. Were you done, sir? Yes. Sir. Okay. Most of the interruptions for speakers have been applause, so I just let that go, but please have respect for fellow members of the public when they're speaking like they have when you were speaking, and um, hopefully we can all share. A, hopefully we can all respect one another and listen to comment whether we agree with it or not. Thank you for honoring that. Welcome. Jackie Griffith, almost 40 years here and 12 years on different city commissions and county commissions. Um, I think this is really unconstitutional. We have an ADA. I want to suggest that everything that this man just said to you, is it's like if you go back 15 years or so, it's what was being said about Roundup. Earlier, it was said about DDT, and we all found out how that was, and now we found out that Roundup is also cancer-causing. I was exposed and went through four major surgeries from a, a pesticide exposure in my mom and dad's business. So I was very sensitive when Roundup came out. I could smell it. I would get sick every summer, but here's the point. People didn't really believe me. They would say just the same kind of thing that this guy has said. <coughs> if you allow this to go through just so that it has to be appealed, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> this is really getting, oh, taking, there, there won't even be a knowledge of when people are sickened by this. I saw a lot of people have to move out of Santa Cruz before we were able to get it off the parks and off the highway and off the city street medians for pesticides. The same thing here, but there's no way they're trying to box this in. I think this is a matter of free speech. It's a matter of the Americans for Disabilities Act, and you're not even going to know what's happening under this thing, so do everything you can. I would say stand up. I stood up on Vietnam. I stood up on the pesticides and several other things since then. We've got to take Take a stand, please. Thank you for your comments. Hi, I'm Gail Nakuna. And um, one of our party asked me to repeat something they could not say, which is they're asking if you're willing to show um, in liability insurance, if anything, anyone is harmed from this. Another person is asking um, if, the, if you can delay this until the FCC investigation, which is in process now, and uh, wait until they're fully investigated because uh, they are a captured agency. Um, another uh, thing is that um, Barry Trower came out of retirement just for the purpose of this um, technology being deployed. He's a Royal uh, British Navy microwave weapons expert. And this is a quote from him. He says, to my knowledge, microwave or radiation sickness was first reported in August 1932 with the symptoms of severe tiredness, fatigue, fitful sleep, headaches, intolerability, and high susceptibility to infection. The paradox, of course, is how microwave radiation can be used as a weapon to cause impairment, illness, and death and at the same time be used as a communications instrument. The Russians beamed the American embassy during the Cold War, and it gave everybody working in the embassy cancer, breast cancers and leukemia, and it was realized then that the low-level microwaves were the perfect stealth weapon to be used on dissident groups around the world, because you, couldn't not, you could make dissident groups sick, give them cancer, change their mental outlook on life, without them even knowing they were being irradiated. The people here really represent thousands and thousands of people in this community that have no idea this meeting is going on or that this technology is being deployed. It is not widely known. When you say, when we hear from government officials that your hands are tied by these rules, 
is like saying you can't fight for your own life. Thank you for your comments. Oh, my name is Esther Francis, and I've been here since 2012. <clears throat> and I'd like to speak up on behalf of the infants and the young people who will be most affected by this kind of proposal who don't have a voice yet. I have a friend on the East Coast who got a brand new electric car and had to get rid of it six weeks later because of her sensitivity. She broke out in a rash, she couldn't be in it. I have other friends here in our local neighborhood who have had rooms next to a smart meter and they have not been able to sleep in their rooms because of their symptoms. So I know that from firsthand experience that people do have these sensitivities, which is a health issue, and these things aren't even reported, the cases I know of. So that's, I, I feel like the research is there and it really behooves us to look into it and to not be in a hurry. I know there were doctors who said tobacco wouldn't hurt you and all the other things that have been shared. So that's what moves me to speak up. I think it's a really real concern and uh, has to do with health freedom and our rights to, to live a full life. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else like to address the commission? This is your last chance. I'm going to. Oh, one time? Yeah, just one. <laughs> one time. One time for everyone. Welcome. Hi, my name is Jane Mio. Um, one of the concerns that I have is that. <clears throat> Actually, this is a project and it would need an EIR in order to really evaluate the, effort, the effects of the uh, 5G. <coughs> the other point that I want to make is that, as we know, we're in the midst of climate change and uh, we have much higher winds than before. These uh, towers are mounted to the PG&E poles, which make them higher. And when you watch, you can see that those poles move very differently from the ones that do not have the towers on it. And I think that should be considered too. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> My name is Rhonda Hayes, and I want to thank you for including the ADA accommodation with your plans. I'm, I have EMF disability. My life has changed greatly since all this stuff has started coming in heavily. I'm no longer able to work, and it's cut my uh, social security, so I'm, you know, really struggling. And of course, I can't get my health taken care of either because of all our medical scenarios here. Um, I would like us to pull together with all the other cities around the Bay and in California who are fighting this successfully. It's being done. We don't have to roll over. We can join together with the others that are, that are pulling this off. We don't have to just, uh, you know, I, I feel like we're becoming like a, a country that we all quote now is how did that ever happen uh, during World War II? And it, it seems like we're, we're just becoming you know, like uh, robots and responding to corporate rule. Um, I would hope that we would stand up for our community, look at this more closely. Um, we do have civic rights. I don't wanna see those go away for a, a faster process. So I hope you guys will consider that. Um, that's about all I have to say on this topic. I'm very, I feel very, I can't even believe this meeting is happening. It's, it's so mind blowing to me, thank you. Thank you for your comments. So this will be the final speaker unless anyone else would like to line up and address the commission. Welcome. Hi, hi there. My name's Carol Pretty. I'm from SoCal. And the reason I'm, I would like three minutes if possible. Sure. Um, the reason I'm very interested is that my ex-husband did his PhD. It was titled Electromagnetics and we work, he worked at Electromagnetic Systems Lab. 
And that man went on to become the Secretary of Defense during the time that they rolled out the 1996 Telecommunication Act, which had a lot of input by the man who's now head of the Department of Justice, William Barr. So what's happening is we are really in the middle of this rollout that can't be stopped, it seems. So the more we can do as citizens, the better it is. You know, I wrote a letter, I gave a lot of information to Bill Monning, and he wrote me a wonderful letter. I couldn't find it, I didn't have time to find it. And he said, we really need to apply the precautionary principle. I know the, man, the gentleman said that he thinks 5G is safer because it's small cell. I'm not so sure that everybody is, if that's correct. So I think we really need to do something and take a stand. And I appreciate anything that you can do um, because when this 1996 Telecommunication Act was rolled out, less EMF came on board. It was made, made by, this company was founded by a Chinese man in New York and they know this causes problems. My commercial insurance policy lists RF radio frequency with lead, asbestos, and radon as an exclusion. In other words, nationwide, my policy backed by Lloyds of London is not gonna cover any damage. I went door to door with, for the smart meters because I wanted to see where people were. I wasn't too excited to have that all the time, you know, because I had seven units I didn't want seven smart meters on a bedroom wall. This is really harming people that live in apartment buildings because everybody has their Wi-Fi and everybody has their routers. And it's putting out a lot of stuff that you can't see. So the problem is it can't be seen, it can't be heard, it can't be smelled, it can't be felt until it's too late. And when it's too late, you can't sleep. You have neurological problems like lead. You have cancer problems like asbestos. It's a real problem, and it's probably gonna be a great conundrum for our society to deal with, because when you get, this is the, the, the biggest problem of, that we could really foresee. And when you get to the internet of things, we're basically helping things. What about people? We're the ones that are living, we're alive. So I'd like to see the precautionary principle, anything that you can do. Um, I think we need to talk to people that live in apartments. This has a, thank you. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> no. I would like to. Sure, that's right. I gave that to others. Okay. You can have one minute. Welcome. Sorry they didn't afford you that. My, my main concern is that we, um, I want to know, the first thing I have is a question, how much money is this county getting for all the right of way that we are giving or selling, sell, selling or giving to Verizon and all these other providers? How much money is this generating for you guys and for me and the public? After all, it is our public right away. Number two, how can these uh, things be put on? Uh, these poles and shoot stuff right into our house 24 seven. That's an experiment on the people. It's against the international conventions, including the Nuremberg Convention to experiment without my consent. That's why I wanna opt, I'm making a petition and I'm gonna opt out and I'm gonna sue some bastards. You get it? Thank you for your comments. We'll close the public hearing now and bring it back to the commission for discussion and potential motion. Um, anyone wanna lead the conversation? Commissioner Schifrin and then Commissioner Spellman. My first question has to do with um, what's really changing here? Uh, the city has an ordinance that regulates wireless communication facilities. Is that not correct? Yes, that's and there's correct. a process that uh, applicants need to go through, and after going through that process, their application is heard by the zoning administrator. Is that not correct? Am I understanding that? If it's a new um, monopole that doesn't use stealth 
requirements is visible from the public that has to go to the zoning administrator for the last 10 or 15 years. If it's a stealth facility that meets all of our requirements in terms of aesthetics, it doesn't have to go to the public. Um, it's a, a administrative design permit approval. So is that appealable to the city council? Yeah, a everything design permit? In, in the zoning ordinance, everything is appealable. Okay, so without this ordinance change, how would these small cell tower facilities be regulated? Would they fall under the regular ordinance and have to go through that process? Yes. So what's, I'm just trying to understand what's being done here, that as a result of the FCC uh, regulation that asks that these facilities be treated differently, is that, and that by treating them differently, um, there's a time limit that we have to follow, otherwise they're already approved, whether we like it or not, as I, under, as yes. I understand it. Um, that what the staff is proposing in the ordinance is that the way of approving them to stay within the time limit so they're not approved automatically is to have them go uh, to the Public Works Department, uh, get a permit from the Public Works Department. That permit would have to uh, uh, comply with a series of design uh, requirements. How different are those design requirements than the requirements that are in the current ordinance? Are they more strict or less strict? It's a different animal. Um, our design permit in the zoning ordinance was really focused 99% on private properties where they would either erect a new monopole with antennas on top or they would put it in the top of a commercial building. That's what all of our regulations are. Um, centered around, we just happen to include any cell phones in the or cellular sites in the right of way. Our existing ordinance says that. And it even emphasized that that would be a good location, an existing utility pole. So we're eliminating that language out of the general or out of the zoning ordinance. And- But, do those, but does, the, do, does the existing ordinance have um, uh, aesthetic criteria in it or design criteria? We have some general design criteria and we're trying to be more specific with the new standards that require us to be more specific uh, by the FCC so people understand what those design criteria are when they come in. And, and just the nature of these applications, they're, they're in the right of way. It's not like they're on a building on private property. So they're right in the right of way. They're gonna be very visible. So us generating these uh, design guidelines will ensure that we get the facilities, the last slides that I showed you, we'll get something that's a little more aesthetically pleasing than what it could be if we didn't have any control over the uh, deployment. So under the current regulations, um, the any application for uh, wireless communication facility is appealable to the city council? Yes. Under well, the, I'm sorry, it'd be appealable to the Planning Commission and then to the City to the Council, city council. So, so there's a, a two levels, yes. I understand that, but ultimately they can be appealed to the City Council. Mm -hmm. Under the new regulations, the as anticipated, the permits from the Public Works Department will be appealable to the City Council. Currently, the way the uh, ordinance reads, yes. Okay, I, I think that would be important to retain that ability of the public to have the council make a final decision on it. So really at root, while the time is much longer under the current ordinance to get to the city council, ultimately that's where, that's the final decision maker under the existing ordinance and under the new ordinance. Under the new ordinance, the public works director would be the ultimate decision maker unless it's appealed, and then it would be the city right. council. Well, uh, under the current ordinance, the ZA is the ultimate decision maker unless it's appealed. Correct. Okay, so I mean, the reality is the city council is the final decision maker if it's appealed. So there's really not a change in terms of the role of the city council of making the final decision about these facilities. That's what I'm trying to get at. That's correct. And if I'm understanding the reality of the design guidelines, in a sense, they're more 
uh, specific as they're supposed to be than they are under the current ordinance. And they s kind of provide more guidance to the staff and more information to the public about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in terms of design. Now, obviously from the testimony we got tonight, uh, that's not really a consideration for people, but that's the only thing legally at this point we have the ability to regulate. Now, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, in terms of the, you know, the testimony about standing up for, uh, to the FCC, standing up to the federal government, the way to do that, it seems to me, if the city council desires to do it, is for them to sue the, F the FCC and the federal government be, uh, and join other suits if that's what they want to do, uh, if that what, what a majority of them decides to do. But as far as um, this ordinance is concerned, as I understand it, if we don't adopt the ordinance, then these facilities can just be built. We have no ability to regulate them. They're deemed approved unless we act within these new shot clocks. So by deemed approved means that they can be built. Is that that's, correct? That's, that's my understanding. Um, <laughs> uh, well, so let me, <clears throat> we have the city attorney's office and she- Let me clarify it a, a little bit more. Not just talking about an application have to, has to be acted on within the time limit, so otherwise it's deemed approved. But what happens if we don't adopt, the, if the city doesn't adopt the ordinance within the time limits that we're, uh, we're facing, or just decides, no, we're not gonna do it, we're not gonna adopt the ordinance. What I'm concerned about is that this would give the um, telecommunications companies the ability to say, okay, you had your chance, you blew it, we're just gonna put up our, um, our facilities and you have no right to stop us uh, because you didn't adopt an ordinance that regulated us. So that's what I'm wondering is what's the effect of not adopting this ordinance? Because that's the testimony we're hearing. Don't adopt the ordinance. Don't, go, don't meet the uh, requirements of the FCC. Uh, that's an option that the city has uh, the city council doesn't have to adopt this ordinance, but my concern is from reading the staff report that that essentially means there's no regulation of these facilities, that the companies can just go out and build them. And that seems to me to put us in an even, put the community into an even worse situation than we have with the limited um, regulatory authority that still exists. So I guess that's my question is what happens if the city doesn't adopt this new ordinance in terms of uh, the small cell facilities. And I see someone is standing up there. Uh, I don't know who you are, but maybe you can answer. This is uh, Stephanie Hall from the city attorney's office. Hi, um, so speaking to your question, first of all, the FCC shot clocks, that went to effect in January. So whether we change the ordinance or not, the city is still required to meet those 60 days or 90 days. Um, so in that sense, if we don't meet those shot clocks, it'll be deemed approved, the facility will be deemed approved, and they can move forward without us being able to have any kind of uh, conditions under an encroachment permit, for example, which is what we're considering with the public works ordinance. As for the aesthetic guidelines, that we have until April 15th to adopt. And it's not entirely clear, but it seems to me that if we don't adopt them by then, then effectively the facility, they could uh, deploy the facilities without us applying any kind of guidelines. So if we want the opportunity to apply some kind of design standards, we have until April 15th to do so. So to, if I'm understanding correctly, um, what goes on here is that with this new ordinance, uh, the public will have the ability around specific facilities to appeal them to the city council. Um, they may have the same objections as we've heard tonight. At least they'll have the ability to state those objections. If the city doesn't adopt this ordinance, then they won't even have the ability to state those objections because there'll never be any public decision making permitted under the FCC rules unless those rules are changed. Is that correct? I believe we still have, they could be appealed under the current ordinance, right? 
They wouldn't be going to. He's the, saying if, the, if, yeah. they, if they can build by right, uh, there would be no pr public process. I think you're right. That, if, well, we, uh, if we didn't meet the shot clock, so if we did not have, if the city did not have a decision within those 60 days or 90 days, it would then be deemed approved. I right, think, but we have no, we would have no procedure for meeting the shot. We would have our existing procedure, which we've stated that we probably cannot meet those shot clock requirements given the public noticing requirements, the appeal requirements and everything else. So that's, I think what Mike, presented was what those timelines could be under our current ordinance and the, and that's why we can't continue with these these uh, small cell and public right of way under our current ordinance just because we can't meet the shot clock under our current ordinance. I think Commissioner Schiffer, <clears throat> what, what you're saying is if we don't approve the ordinance, there'll be no public process and these can be installed. If we approve this ordinance, there still will be the opportunity of a public process. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, that's what I'm asking. Well, yeah. I, there, I think we so. have a public yes. process, but I think people will either choose not to participate or they'll participate and we won't be able to meet the requirements and so they will be deemed approved. So Without a public process. Well, because we, right. we can't meet our own process that's already existing. So we're saying we need this new process. I understand that. Okay, thank you. I had another question, but I'll wait and let okay. the Commissioner Spellman. Thank you. Yeah, so this obviously is a very tough uh, topic. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and sharing your your thoughts. You know, on a on a personal level. Um, we'll come back to Commissioner Spellman. Any other? I have, uh, I remember my friend. Some of the testimony we heard was that the um, FCC rules are being challenged by various people and the concern with the, com with the city approving the ordinance is that once it's approved, it's sort of set in stone. My understanding would be if the FCC regulations were overturned the and new, different, old requirements were put back in force, the ordinance would return to the commission and the council for revision. Is that not correct? Yeah, that'd be correct. So as we are forced to adjust to uh, this new FCC regulations for these small cell facilities, and that's why this ordinance is in front of us, to try, as I see it, it's an attempt to um, have as much city authority over the small cell facilities as we can have under the, the existing regulations. If those regulations change, as we had to adjust to these, we would adjust to the new ones. So it's not like um, this isn't a moving target. And if there's more information that comes out or there are court decisions that come out that change um, what, the, uh, what the rules are, um, the city will have the ability to change its ordinance to, and probably will have to change its ordinance to reflect those rules. That's correct. You have more about that, Mike, or just? Yeah, I think we've got something in here about that. You're talking about the FCC changing rules well, and if regulations? There, if, there, if there's a lawsuit that successfully challenges them or some constitutional issue that's been raised that is successful. I then. think we can always have a chance to change. Right, I just want the public to be, members of the public to be clear that from what I'm hearing staff saying, this is being done um, because um, this, is the, this is the most the city can do to regulate um, the, the, these kinds of facilities under the current rules. And whether we like it or not, we're governed by those laws. And I'm certainly, I certainly heard from a lot of people that they don't like it. But as an institution, and as representatives of that as institution, we have to follow the law. And I don't think we have the ability to say, no, we're not gonna do it. It may well be that um, we don't have the choice, but the city has the choice to um, challenge the law but we are 
uh, a society that supposedly is governed by laws. And so I think certainly as I feel as a member of this commission, it's uh, incumbent on me and I think incumbent on us to really uh, do what the law requires. In the, in the ordinance that it, actually in the existing ordinance it says the city shall review and may revise this chapter after a change of the FCC regulations which state local governments may regulate wireless telecommunications mm -hmm. based on their health effects and it also talks about if the rapid changing uh, of uh, wireless communications that uh, we can change things as well. So that's already in the current ordinance. Okay, and then the final thing I'll say is that the ability of, as I've seen over the years, the ability of, of local governments to regulate telecommunications facility has shrunk over time. And one of the reasons it shrunk over time is, uh, has been, uh, has been um, presented to us tonight. The telecommunications industry is extremely powerful. And what I'm afraid of, or what I suggest is not an unlikely outcome, of the city refusing to abide by the rules is that the FCC will take away all authority at the local level. We've seen that happen with cable, where um, the city and county no longer can regulate the, ca have, regulate the cable companies. They were able to change the law at the state level. Um, and what I'd be concerned about is if the, if the, if the localities aren't willing to abide by the rules that have been set down, they'll just change the rules again and take away what little authority still remains. And unfortunately, I think they have the legal ability to do that. So uh, although that can be challenged as well, uh, um, I think it's uh, a, 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 not an unre a unlikely outcome. I'll be, I'd be willing to make a motion I want to, you know, I don't, Commissioners don't seem like they're jumping forward. Uh, go ahead and make a motion and then the rest of the discussion can be on that motion if there's a second. I would move that we uh, support the staff recommendation with a change uh, in section 24.12.1410 to add under B7 the words at the end of the sentence and small cell standards and guidelines policy adopted by the city council so that it makes clear that the um, cell, the small cell facilities are to be governed by those guidelines. So you're moving the staff recommendation with that slight with that amendment? Change. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Um, is there any discussion of the, around the motion? Commissioner Spellman. So I'd like to make some other comments around this. I think my take on that is a little bit different. I don't think we are, I think we can do much better than the language that's presented to us tonight, if that's the direction we decide to go. Um, I've done you know, some research on this, even in the past week, for example, uh, Monterey's recent ordinance on their communications started essentially with a, a public uh, committee, essentially, that was advising the ruling and their wording of their ordinance, and if you read it, <laughs> the gist of it gets back to um, public participation. Come back to me. Commissioner Greenberg. Um, yeah, uh, I also wanted to uh, echo the thanks for everyone sharing their experience and knowledge on this on this topic, and it's a very sensitive one. Um, and I think a lot of the frustration having to do with like this feeling that our hands are tied and what what is how can we be strategic, I suppose, within this kind of legal constraint that we're facing. And I guess one question I had um, apropos of what Commissioner Spellman is talking about, uh, 
some uh, people spoke about the Bay Area having different kinds of approaches to this current situation. And I'm wondering if the staff have reviewed other local ordinances and if there's kind of a unanimity in this or if there's variation in the way that people are approaching this in response to some of these concerns. So that's kind of one sort of a general question that I'm interested to hear what Monterey is doing. Um, uh, people brought up the issue of liability insurance. And so while we're all, while we're constrained by, you know, the higher scale of government, government and the FCC, also the question of what would happen if someone were to experience some kind of deleterious effect of this and how, where would that go, with, you know, um, in terms of our own liability. Um, and someone, and a third point is someone brought up uh, the question of <coughs> environmental impact. I don't know if this is subject to CEQA in the same way or if that, you know, how that plays into this environmental impact review. Um, and I have a fourth question, but I, I'll hold off because I've already asked three questions. So the comparative question and what your sense is of other approaches to this, um, issues of liability and environmental <coughs> Um, the other agencies that I've looked at are um, basically doing the same thing that we're doing. Um, I haven't seen any agency that was trying to write regulations that, um, based on health effects. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer at all about the insurance. Um, I've, I've heard that before, but I have no idea how to respond to that. What was the third thing? Environmental impact review. Oh, whether oh. this is subject in any way, to, whether individual, you know, installations could be appealed on, on the basis or, you know, would be subject to EIR or, you know, how that plays out. I don't know. Yeah, the ordinance amendment uh, does not require an EIR. If, if somebody thought an EIR would be required for one of the sites, it would have to be based on some sort of an impact. Right. And if it's a health thing, again, you know, no. We see less than 1% of the RF emissions than what the federal government allows. And our hands are tied when it comes to regulating these um, facilities based on health effects. Is it possible that uh, we could conduct our own study of health effects or other jurisdictions could or, you know, given that, I mean, it's kind of, it, one person brought up the point that there's a sense in the public's mind that this is kind of this large experiment that's being undertaken. Um, and so it seems like an opportunity in a, in a way it, to study these effects um, in, a more, in a more systematic way. I don't know if anyone's thinking along those lines. Um, that's, I don't know if that's something that, how that would take place, but um, you're smiling. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking yeah. of all the implications. Um, yeah. I think the answer is no. The yeah. federal, you know, the federal government regulates the health and, and we're, um, partly enacting what they've stated, you know, they, they're they're regulating it yeah. for us to try to. We do our own studies to make sure, like Mike said, that yeah. it meets those standards. But that's the best we can do. Yeah. Okay. A final. Well, maybe I I put a lot of things out there. Do you have any? Does any? Do any commissioners have responses to those questions about? I was just going to res uh, follow up on your questions. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to ask the city attorney to um, weigh in on the liability issue liability question, because yeah. I think in adopting an ordinance, um, the city would not have any liability, but I could be wrong. So that's why I wanted to ask. Good evening, Barbara Choi with the city attorney's office. And I want to address the question about liability. So as part of uh, approving an application, we typically currently require an encroachment permit and the encroachment permit allows uh, an agreement to be entered into between the carrier and the city whereby the carrier is required to indemnify and defend and hold harmless the city uh, relating to its use of the city's public right-of-way. And also uh, we require the carrier to provide, uh, to meet the insurance requirements. Now, with when we, I'm currently um, in the process of drafting and master license agreement. And that would be used to have the carriers enter into an agreement with the city and 
the city would be able to uh, require specific terms and conditions relating to the carrier's use of the public right-of-way. And in that agreement, uh, is one of the major requirements would be to hold the city harmless and to defend and identify us for relating to any of their use of um, their small cell wireless facility. And also we would impose insurance requirements for use of our right of way. So the city would be protected. I have a question since you're up here. Uh, I should remind you, use the mic if you can so everyone can hear you well. Did, did you, in advising staff for um, for this uh, ordinance change, did you, do you do research on what some of the other communities are doing? The, the reference was made to other communities fighting back and that type of thing, and do you in, research that so that you can inform staff in a way that's aware of those other efforts, a different approach? I'm going to defer to Stephanie on sure. this. We're still in the process of researching that, but like Mike said, um, we haven't seen any other city base or regulating any of the facilities based on environmental effects of RF emissions. Have you seen them push back like creatively? I mean, we're dictate, it's dictated on, it's just aesthetics only. And so are they pushing back or is that, have you, have you seen them? There, you know, there are spacing requirements, that, that kind of thing, um, but not based on RF emissions. Okay. I have a question sort ahead, of related yeah. to that, which is, could it be construed that the distance uh, from a home or you know residential area to one of these installations, uh, that that could be considered aesthetic? I have, I don't know if you can answer. <coughs> it's not really a legal question. Mm. Sure. Yeah, if it was in the middle of a neighborhood, right. yeah, that would be an aesthetic even consideration. Yeah, even if it's obscured in some way, you could say. You know, we've, we've come up with this through the course of four or five years of having these come in front of us, and we've sort of whittled down to the point where, mm -hmm. you know, where we, we don't have much control, but um, the kinds of facilities that we're hoping they deploy are going to look similar to these kinds of things on the screen. We did look at other cities to see what other cities were doing, so we're pretty consistent with what other cities are. I don't know what Monterey is doing. I don't remember seeing anything, but uh, I think we looked at Palo Alto and some other Marin, jurisdictions. Uh, um, so. The, the the public the public hearing is closed. I'm so, I'm sure that's frustrating for folks sometimes, but we're dis discussing what the commission will do on this if we're going to so, make so we did moment. try to for the design guidelines you know look at what other cities were doing and propose what's consistent with other cities and was distance ever part of those design guidelines yeah and i think the, the um from talking with mike they, they there was some variety in the in the what other cities were requiring. I don't know, do you wanna say how we got came up with our recommendation? Mike, yeah, can you were, address some... the 1500 as well? Cause that was a, a specific recommendation shared a number of times tonight. Um, you could certainly change it. It's in the design guideline. Uh, there's also uh, an allowance where if they can show that, uh, that they need something less than 1500, then the public works director can approve it. So it's based on You've seen those circles before. They have all their search rings and all this stuff, and it d depends on the equipment. So I've heard in the last three or four years that these have had a range from, I think it was the smallest one was maybe 300 feet that came to the Planning Commission, and then some uh, had a range of 1,000. So there, there is a different range, and I think that they pick the equipment based on the coverage that they're trying to get. Mr. Spellman? Yeah, I think those are the moves in the right direction, putting the, the limit on how close these can be together. We, we can make a stand on that and include language in our ordinance. Uh, Monterey, I believe they still have a public hearing process and still meet the shot clock requirements. It's truncated and it's expedited. I don't know how it actually works. I just read it today, um, but they're, they're somehow able to keep that part of the process. 
aside from a full on public hearing, I think there needs to at least be noticing to the public within some distance of any proposed installation. Um, Berkeley has an actual full section in their wireless ordinance that deals with public information requirements, which again is putting the word out, where are these things going? How many of them are there? Uh, their city website is required to have a map that shows these so anybody could go and, and understand you know, how insidious the, the infiltration is happening and how quickly. Um, <clears throat> we can't. <laughs> Josh. We can't keep ourselves out of that equation. So we were looking at adding a notification within 300 feet. That is correct. That was in the original draft of uh, the ordinance that we had, yes. And um, so I, so we're still working on this public works element. And I shot uh, an email to you, and I haven't heard back from the city attorney, but we are also suggesting that the carrier would conduct a community meeting at a um, public facility that was close to the project site and that uh, they had the same noticing requirements. I mean, we aren't thinking about this stuff. We're thinking that they have to do the public noticing just the same as we do for planning commission or the zoning administrator. It'd be a 300 foot radius. It would be posted at the site. They would conduct a, a meeting and that would be part of their application submittal requirements. And I might say that's part of the public works process right now for things that are going up right now. They do have to notify people within a certain distance of the facility. So then my recollection of their ordinance is that the public hearing still required. So I, you know, I understand the noticing. That's a good thing that those things still happen. It's about getting the people out so they have a chance to speak and, and educate other people about, you know, the issues that are behind us or in front of us. You know, anybody that's done any. Um, research on this, you know, there, there's just too many questions unanswered. Um, I had a question for staff about um, 6G will be the next thing and all of that, and then I guess we just as written would the ordinance, would the change um, prevent the utility from ramping to a new technology or modifying it all? Or, I mean, I know we can always come back and look at an ordinance, but are there constraints on what they can do? Um, I don't know what, I don't know, 6G. Oh, if they turn that, into 6G or 7G? I mean, no. there will be eventually. I don't yeah. and I know we can revisit it, but is there, is there language that says you can only do so much? No. Okay. My other question was with regard to the number of um, EAS or other utilities that can be approved. There's not a number, a maximum per year or a maximum density in a, on a block or there's nothing. No, as a matter of fact, the one thing that we have seen is other agencies restricting the applicant to a limited number of applications they can submit per month because everybody's anticipating that we're just going to get a flood of these things, so. Limiting it to the right. a maximum number. Right, okay. so we'll, we'll say something like, uh, and I'm not sure if we've got that in the ordinance or not, I know we've talked about it, uh, limit uh, any one carrier to uh, no more than six applications a month, let's okay. say. I had a question about the noticing, I was happy to hear you talk about the noticing, but help me understand, um, so the public works director has the, has the ability to approve these um, if we were to approve this change. And then it would just be on a consent agenda for public, for a city council or how? What if it was appealed, then it would go to the city council. Okay. Otherwise it's the sole discretion of the public works director. Okay, so this happens right out front of my house and I'm, because it's 300 feet, I'm noticed. Is that right? Right, I, currently what we're discussing is having the applicant provide 
public notification and a meeting if people are interested and explain the project, show them, um, um, you know, their RF analysis, show them a photo simulation of what the site would look like. And that package would be provided to us with their application. So they're gonna do that work up front. That's what we're hoping we end up with. They're going to, for every installation, yes, they're going to reach out. They're going, they have the burden to reach out to the public and then bring that to you. Correct. Or to Public Works. Okay, and then unless it's appealed, it doesn't go to council. Correct. Right, okay. Um, See my other, just looking at my notes here. That's, those are some of the only questions I had. Commissioner Schifrin. Yeah, I think we're, this is a sort of a strange situation, it seems There's to me, in that we're approving an ordinance that's based on another ordinance that we're not approving, and that this all has to be approved by the city council by April in order to uh, avoid, in order to be able to continue to regulate. So what I would suggest um, that we, what I would like to add to the motion, if it's okay with the second, is a few recommendations that we would make um, for uh, provisions in this other ordinance that is being drafted by staff and that will ultimately go to the city council, but not to us, if I'm understanding correctly. Correct. And so what I would say is that I would like to add that uh, the that other ordinance, which would be the, I guess what I'd call it the permitting ordinance, include provisions for um, meaningful public noticing, um, at, at least a public hear, uh, meeting and to, con to consider a public hearing. Um, to, cons to include a recommendation on the limit of the number of applications that uh, a carrier could submit each month. So uh, let me just start with those and get those out there. That's what I've been hearing from other commissioners about um, provisions that really belong in the permitting ordinance in terms of how the permitting ordinance is gonna operate as opposed to this ordinance. And um, then at least that, was, that would be part of our recommendation that would go up to the council when they consider the ordinance to meet the timeline. So that's, if it's okay with the second, then- Nodding, Commissioner Singleton agrees with I that. I would add those, uh, those to the motion. Oz, do you wanna add more? No, but I might have forgotten something that's important to somebody else. So I'm willing to consider more in I'm terms I'm feeling of like we could be close to a vote, but I don't want to truncate the conversation. Other comments? Commissioner Conway? Do my best here to make a comment. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate your um, earlier take on this, Commissioner. I am concerned about adding to a process that's going to be um, administratively burdensome and isn't going to result in any more actual review um, I think that obviously there's a very high degree of interest in public participation. Um, so along with, with your later comments where you're talking about additional process, um, I think process that in which the burden's on the company um, and not on the city and doesn't add to the administrative burden of the city to no effect um, would be important to me. Um, I don't know if that was clear enough, but um, I, I know that you're you're busy thinking about it. And one of them is we want to provide um, an opportunity for meaningful voice and knowledge um, without adding cost and time to the city and not actually accomplishing anything additional for the community. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Spellman. Yes, yeah, so I think one that falls clearly into that category is the distance between any new proposed facilities. If the companies are telling us this technology reaches 3,000, certainly 2,000 feet, I think 1,500 feet is a reasonable starting point. There's already an, an out for them that says if they prove that their coverage doesn't work with that number, that they basically can put it closer. But if we don't say we'd like it, at least 1,500 feet apart, we're not gonna get them 1,500 feet apart. 
So if I'm understanding, if I could go, if I'm understanding what you're uh, suggesting, it would be into the uh, guideline policy. H2. Number four was site location restrictions. There would be a uh, uh, section D that would say, um, we have a section B that has 500. We can just change that to 1500 very simply. So that's on page two, it's under 4B, residential zone districts, one facility every 1500 uh, feet. Again, I would uh, add that to the motion if it's acceptable to the second. It's acceptable. A lot of dead air here, so I don't want to cut it off. Be ready to call for the question yeah. unless there's more. Not hearing any. Um, no. Mr. Conway? Um, I'm not convinced of the um, of the benefit of the 1,500 feet. You wouldn't be in? Um, I'm, I wouldn't be crazy about that. Discuss that a little then. Yeah. Want to sell that or? You wanna... Well. Um, I'm pretty much responding. I, I didn't include it in my original. Um, my understanding that the city had a distance requirement from schools that was challenged uh, successfully by uh, one of the carriers and it was kicked out. Um, I see this provision as a way of trying to respond to public comment. Uh, if the carriers don't like it, uh, they will complain about it and sue us and the city will have to change it. So but the way that, that that reads is that. And it does give an out, you know. There is an out. So and it's specifically if the carrier says that uh, 1500 is too great in this instance. So if they can show the public works director um, that by refusal of a uh, um, new facility within that 1500 feet will result in the creation of a coverage gap that the um, public works director can waive that 1500 foot Let me setback. see that we're on a yeah. little bit thin ice here to sort of say this is an aesthetic concern. But uh, in answer to one of our commissioner's uh, questions, uh, staff did say that distance is an aesthetic issue. So um, I think we could be legitimate. Uh, at least we can we can we can argue that it passes the straight face test. <laughs> Mr. Conway, are you compelled? Are you convinced? Uh, you know, and um, I'm concerned about not cost causing additional expense to the city that isn't going to actually accomplish anything. That's what I'm coming back to. I'm not. Um, if uh, if we can reasonably call this aesthetic, um, and uh, we are not exposing. Uh, the city to unnecessary cost, and again, that isn't going to accomplish anything. Any of the, you know, goals that were discussed tonight, um, we've got an out for it. Um, that is sound, seems like it's reasonable, um, but I um, that that's my concern that we get caught up in a mm -hmm. kind of a tail chaser of of um, legal work that um, we're not winning anything. Commissioner Singleton, and then Commissioner Spellman. I, I largely echo the comments that um, Commissioner Conway said. Um, I'm skeptical of the effectiveness of creating a 1500 foot um, barrier for aesthetic reasons in the ordinance, but at the same time, there's an out for it. They'll come back and complain if it's causing any problems. Staff, I'm sure, will let us know if it's causing any onerous uh, administrative burden. Um, so it, for the purposes of responding to public comment and com public concerns and the precautionary principle, it seems like a reasonable and appropriate consideration for aesthetic purposes. It's my other thought on it is that the um, council can chew on this with addition, maybe the city attorney or staff can ad advise, you know, we have, we'll give a recommendation and then you all can qualify it or add to it. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I mean, we're not addressing the elephant in the room. We can't talk about health issues or exposure issues. We can only talk about aesthetic issues. And I would argue that this is certainly an aesthetic issue if we have one third the amount of poles being added to by virtue of 15 versus five, then it's, it's certainly an aesthetic issue. Um, I would hopefully then also trickle down to less work for staff if they've got a third less or two thirds less applications because they can only go in, then it's 
a much more efficient process for them. So. Sounds like Commissioner Schiffen. You brought up a, um, oh, somebody brought up the point about this coming back to us if, the, if it becomes a legal problem. My understanding is that the small cell standards and guidelines policy are, is not per se part of the ordinance and right. that it will be adopted by the council and if it needs to change, it will be changed by the council. So it doesn't, it won't need to come back to us unless the council decides to send it to us for some reason. Is that, am I, is, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. Okay, good. Commissioner Greenberg. Um, so I would support this uh, direction for the reasons mentioned and I think there are a set of rationales for it. Um, I, th I don't know if there's a way we could endeavor to um, just conduct more research into what other air and what other jurisdictions are are doing on this um, and my understanding is so Monterey the case of Monterey that perhaps other areas in the North Bay um, <coughs> like Marin <coughs> Valley um, are doing some other are making other efforts and I don't know what those have resulted in but I'd just be interested in in our conducting more research into what other approaches are being taken okay. on this how about a suggestion that we've honoring the calendar deadlines that we um, not telling people how to vote but we vote on it and then maybe add yeah. um, narrative that we wished uh, we were trying to honor the deadlines and we wished we could have had some more time to research and we recommend council consider that they've got a deadline as well but we're trying to not slow them down how's that sound that sounds good to me yeah any other discussion i'm going to call the vote unless folks are press anxious i'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry um could we have a roll call vote please commissioner schifrin aye conway aye spellman aye singleton aye greenberg aye Hepping? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you to members of the public for coming um, and enduring the process and sharing your comment and for caring enough to be here. Um, thanks, staff. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. I just wanted to say the council did invite the planning commission.